Hey everyone, my name is Lung. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at the REN project. And uh, at the REN project, we're building RENVM, which is an interoperability bridge between blockchains. Uh, so today I want to talk to you about how we can use something like that to bring cross-chain assets to DeFi. Um, I want to talk about what universal interoperability is, uh, I want to touch on why it's important, and I want to touch on some of the technical challenges in achieving this. And I want to talk about how we can solve some of the challenges and ultimately arrive at, at the solution that is RenVM. So jumping straight in, what is uh, universal interoperability? Well, interoperability is talked about a lot, and uh, it's a label that gets slapped on a lot of different projects, uh, and often because projects exhibit a very specialized form of interoperability. And when we talk about interoperability, we're really just talking about the ability for two blockchains to talk to each other. But when we talk about universal interoperability, we're saying that we want these blockchains to talk to each other about any particular asset uh, between any two blockchains and for any application, uh, even if it's an application that doesn't yet exist. So the problem with specialized forms of interoperability is that they're only good for the specific thing that they specialize in. And I think, you know, when we built uh, the blockchain community years ago, we couldn't have imagined some of the applications that we have today. So when we build a universal interoperability solution, we need to make sure that it's going to continue to work into the future. So why do we want this? Well, basically, it comes down to the fact that some projects are good at some things and some projects are bad at some things. Now, these could be technical solutions, which are probably uh, the more focused on things. So whether we're talking about transaction throughput or we're talking about uh, transaction finality, but it can also be a financial thing. So we can be talking about market capitalization or liquidity, uh, but it can also be a community thing. So we can be talking about marketing and user adoption, or we can be talking about you know, the grassroots DeFi ecosystem that a blockchain like Ethereum has. And the other thing we talk about generally is diversity of asset classes. So this slide was taken uh, from the end of last year. So these numbers are probably a little bit out of date. But at the moment, most of Ethereum DeFi is built on the back of ETH. Uh, and it's also built on the back of a few stable coins. But we look at the Bitcoin uh, market cap and we see that there's a much bigger uh, pool of assets to tap into there. And it's not just Bitcoin. This is also the case for Zcash, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin. Most of the top 10 projects are not actually uh, accessible to Ethereum today. But being able to tap into that using a universal interoperability solution will allow us to use these different assets and different asset classes in our DeFi ecosystems. And, and this is great for lending and borrowing platforms. It's great for automated market making bots. It's great for liquidity. It generally just helps us build a more mature and capable uh, DeFi financial system. The other thing that uh, we get with diversity is a bit of risk diversification as well. So if a single asset class crashes, we may see that our other assets remain stable or they, they do something else, or they maybe don't crash nearly as hard. And this can help us keep our systems uh, less likely to liquidate or uh, continue to be stable in times of volatility, or at least more stable. So there's already a few approaches to interoperability, but none of them really hit what we might call universal. And there's atomic swaps, which are great for exchanging two assets. As long as you already know who you're going to exchange the asset with, you already know what assets you're working with, and you already know the price, and you're okay with either party being able to cancel the swap at any point. Uh, so this is a pretty limited use case, and there hasn't been huge adoption of atomic swaps. And they don't work for general applications, uh, and they don't actually work for every single blockchain either. Uh, the other uh, approach is oracles, which allow us to access a price feed uh, from assets on other chains. And this can be useful for creating synthetics, and synthetics can be useful for gaining price exposure, but they're not useful for being able to redeem the underlying asset. If you had a synthetic Bitcoin, this is not the same thing as actually having access to Bitcoin. Then we have multi-sigs and we also have custodians. These are solutions that are sort of active at the moment in some way or another, and we'll talk a little bit about them in a minute, but they allow for tokenized representation. We also have relays, which allow us to take the headers of one chain and embed them in another. And this can be useful for transferring information from one chain to another, but relays aren't always bi-directional. For example, you can't put something into uh, the Bitcoin blockchain as far as a relay goes because its scripting language is just not powerful enough. And finally, we have layer one protocols. Layer one protocols try to address interoperability right within the blockchain itself. Uh, for example, Polkadot or Cosmos. 
And while this is super useful, it's still not quite universal because Bitcoin doesn't speak those languages. Zcash doesn't speak those languages. Litecoin, um, even Ethereum don't. And it's unlikely that they'll adopt them. So we need a, a different solution. We need something that can cater to all of these blockchains, all of the assets, and allow us to still communicate with any kind of application. So the interoperability solution we're looking for, it needs to be able to support a wide range of assets. It needs to be able to support data and events, and it needs to be able to protect itself against adversaries. Uh, supporting a wide range of events is a pretty obvious uh, need. Uh, the, the use for, for cryptocurrencies and uh, access to assets on other chains is sort of the core desire when it comes to universal interoperability. The ability to cater to data and events allow us to directly call smart contracts. So it's not a very good user experience if you have to move your asset. And then as a second step, you have to interact with a smart contract. This, when you want to sort of compound this over multiple chains and multiple applications, this gets very messy very quickly. And obviously every decentralized system that we want to build needs to know how it's going to protect itself from adversaries, both rational and irrational. So let's jump into how we can uh, support assets. But generally speaking, the most general and flexible approach to asset, uh, moving assets between chains is something called tokenized representation. And at a high level, they all do more or less the same thing. Let's say we want to move Bitcoin onto Ethereum and we have some user Alice. She would take that Bitcoin and she would put it into a private key. And that Bitcoin would be locked in that private key for redemption at a later time. And then that private key would return a minting signature that gives Alice the right to mint an ERC-20 representation of that Bitcoin on Ethereum. And then at any point, Alice can give that uh, ERC-20 to other people or, or use it inside a smart contract. And then someone can burn all or part of that Bitcoin and redeem the underlying asset again and get their real Bitcoin back on the Bitcoin blockchain. So the, the secret or the, the, the interesting stuff, the guts of it all is how do we manage this private key? The first and most obvious way is to use a central custodian. And there are solutions out there like WBTC that have recently been adopted into MakerDAO that do exactly this. You have a single custodian that takes control of the private key and they manage its security. Now this has a few uh, advantages and it has some obvious disadvantages. It's fast, the custodian only has to pr provide one signature. It's cheap because as far as on-chain transactions go, we're still only talking about one signature, which is about as cheap as it gets. Uh, and it's easy. We have a pretty good understanding of how to manage individual private keys. This is something we've been doing since the birth of blockchain. Uh, but obviously it's trusted and permissioned. So you need to trust that the underlying custodian is gonna behave, both in the sense that they're not gonna run away with the money and in the sense that they're gonna honor all use of the system. So if you deposit a Bitcoin into their private key, they will mint you an ERC-20 representation. And if you burn an ERC-20 representation, they will give you back your original Bitcoin. But even if you do trust them, it's still not fault tolerant. Uh, this single custodian could have an accidental fault, whether malicious or otherwise, they could, their system could accidentally go offline temporarily and you might miss a price opportunity, uh, or it could be hacked and, and they could lose funds that way. So even if you trust the custodian, there are other ways in which this sort of single uh, central system can fail. So the next most obvious step to take is to turn this private key into a multi-sig, which uh, we have in this diagram a two out of three multi-sig. So it's similar to a custodian, but instead of a single entity being in charge, we have multiple entities and they collectively are able to take custody of the Bitcoin and collectively mint it as an ERC-20. And in this case, you may only need, let's say two out of three or 15 out of 20 or something like this. Now this is an improvement and it still has some of the advantages, but it has its own disadvantages. So it's still fast. Each party in this multi-sig only has to do one signature and they don't have to communicate with each other. It's not cheap though, because when you wanna take these uh, signatures and you wanna put them on chain and you wanna make as many of them as possible to be as decentralized as possible, this starts getting very expensive to, to verify. Um, it is easy, you know, where most people are pretty comfortable with multi-signatures, most blockchains support multi-signatures. Um, however, it's still not quite there. You know, it, it's, it's still semi-trusted and semi-permissioned because at most, at least on the Bitcoin chain, you can have 20 out of 20 uh, in a multi-sig, which is still not very decentralized. We, we want to be able to do much better than that. Um, uh, it is fault tolerant to some degree, Some depending on how you configure it, you can have some parties go offline, but either accidentally or, or intentionally. 
So the next step up is multi-party computations. So this is sort of a newer solution. And what this allows us to do is it allows us to take a private key and kind of turn it into a multi-sig by breaking it down into cryptographic shares that we can distribute to hundreds of nodes. This is great, it's cheap, um, because to the chain, it only looks like a single transaction, uh, a single private key. It's trustless and permissionless in the sense that we can scale this up much larger than we can scale a multi-sig. However, modern MPC algorithms that are used for ECDSA signing are not fault tolerant. There are moments where a single machine can go offline and the whole uh, algorithm has to be restarted and retried again. And, and this is not very practical in a globally distributed Byzantine network, which is the setting in which we're operating. So at the REN team, we've developed a, a new MPC algorithm called AZL, which gives us these features that we really want. It, uh, at any point in the algorithm, up to one third of the parties can fail and the algorithm can still proceed. And it's also much more efficient than modern MPC algorithms, so we can scale it up much larger. Right now, we're running this on 200 machines, uh, and they're able to achieve a theoretical maximum of 700 transactions per second at that, at that size. So RZL is cheap. Uh, it's trustless and permissionless. We can scale this up to hundreds of machines, and it's fault tolerant. Uh, and it also remains Byzantine fault tolerant. So much like Tendermint consensus algorithm or many of the consensus algorithms out there, it is able to proceed in a safe and se secure way as long as less than one third of the participants are adversarial. So this is how we implement uh, asset support. We use this tokenized representation where the private key is managed by an MPC algorithm. So next we need to think about data and events and how we can attach them to our asset transfers. This is because we want to be able to directly call smart contracts. If we don't have uh, the addition of data, then we can't know what smart contract we're calling and we have to break it down into multiple steps and expose the user to wrapping and unwrapping. And this is going to get very messy if you want to start interacting with multiple DeFi applications on multiple chains with multiple different types of assets, you're going to be exposed to many, many different steps and users are going to have to juggle all sorts of tokens to make this work. And it's, it's just not viable. So instead of sending it to a private queue, we actually send it to a script. We make sure the script is only spendable by the MPC network, so it's essentially equivalent. And inside that script, we put a hash of our application data. And when our MPC network signs our minting signature, it also signs this hash. And that kind of commits to this application data. That means when we present it to the chain, where we're going to mint our tokenized representation, this data cannot be modified. So we can leave this up to third parties to submit on our behalf. We can avoid gas. We can avoid all of these complications. So it looks something like this. Alice transfers it to a script. That script contains the amount. It contains a hash of the data and it contains a little bit of extra stuff saying that it can only be spent by the MPC network. And instead of just signing the amount, the MPC network also signs the amount and the hash. And then we can present this to the chain and we can also present our application data and the chain can verify that that data ultimately hashes to what was signed by the MPC network. So using this technique, we can support data and events. So lastly, we need to think about how we can protect ourselves against adversaries. All Byzantine networks have some attack threshold. They have some threshold beyond which they're no longer safe and their properties no longer hold. So it's important that we understand what that threshold is, what can happen, and, and we can make it as hard as possible for a rational adversary who wants to profit from the system to be able to do so, and as hard as possible for an irrational adversary who just wants to attack the system because they want to attack the system. Maybe they're a government, maybe they're a competitor, or maybe they just want to watch the world burn. So a common solution to this is understanding that there is amount of value in our universal interoperability protocol that can be extracted. And we call this the locked value. These are all the assets that are currently away from home that your universal interoperability protocol is, is managing. And we want the cost to attack the system to be higher than that locked value. And the easiest way to do this, and the only way to, to put a theoretical limit on this that we know of, is to require a bond. So every node has a bond that they have to submit in order to participate in the MPC network. And collectively, we want to try and keep this bond value above the locked asset value. Now, traditionally, this is usually done with things like liquidation mechanisms. And this works very well for DeFi applications, but it does not work for cross-chain interoperability solutions. And it doesn't work for a number of reasons. Uh, so instead, 
RenVM uses something called adjusted fees. So when we have our locked value, let's call it L, and we have our bond, which we want to keep, let's say, at three times larger than that. As L grows, or as B shrinks, uh, both are sort of equivalent in direction, we need to suddenly adjust B. Now, typically in a liquidation mechanism, you would require all of the nodes to bring in more collateral and bump it up. And if they don't do this, they would be liquidated, which is very dangerous. Uh, it's risky for the nodes. It reduces the capacity of the system and it cannot uh, stay in a recovered state if there's strong market volatility, which we know happens in crypto all the time and, and happened as recently as March of this year. So instead of liquidating, we adjust the underlying fees. Now, when you adjust the fees of the system, one of two things has to eventually happen. Either the bond becomes worth more because the fees being generated by the system are more, or demand shrinks in response to the increased fees. But either way, the balance between the locked value and the bond value is restored. And we can keep the bond value greater than the locked value. And this means that at any time, if someone steals the locked value, only at that time, when they're actually malicious, do we take away their bond and we use it to restore the peg? So such a system allows us to restore the peg. It has no explicit price fee. It has no risk for the nodes, which is not the case in a liquidation mechanism. It's strong during times of high market volatility. Uh, as more market volatility is there, volume typically increases, so fees increase and so capacity increases. And it only slashes nodes under adversarial conditions. The downside is that there's latency. If you increase the fees, the bond value doesn't instantly increase, nor does demand instantly drop. But this is why we have other protection mechanisms. Uh, and also it requires continuous governance, but you can get around that by having a model that the node operator commits to, and then the node always votes in accordance with that model. So to protect against an irrational adversary and to protect against latency in response uh, to demand and the bond value changing, you introduce a large number of nodes. So as I said before, RenVM uses 200 nodes. And we shuffle those nodes randomly and regularly. You can shuffle them literally every single block if you want to. Uh, and the only sort of limiting factor is the fees of the underlying chain that you're working with, let's say Bitcoin. Uh, and you can also introduce some level of community governance and reputation to help secure the system uh, that an irrational adversary typically has a much harder time of subverting. So RenVM has all of these features. We bundled all of these solutions together and, and we've uh, called it RenVM. It allows us to support Zcash, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin and Ethereum today, but can work on theoretically any two uh, pairs of blockchains. Uh, it can uh, bounce a single transaction through multiple chains and multiple applications in a single go so that the user never has to experience wrapping and unwrapping. It protects itself against adversaries using the mechanisms we described, and that also allows it to remain capital efficient in the face of increased demand. Uh, we'll be live on mainnet very soon. We expect to be live sometime this month. Uh, at this stage, we're just waiting for our orders to be completed, uh, but that is stinted for a mid to late May release. So if you want to learn more about it or you want to start building with it, come check us out on Telegram, uh, follow us on Twitter, check out our GitHub, uh, get in touch with us, let us know if you have any criticisms, any questions, and we'll be able to hopefully absorb your feedback and uh, have a chat with you. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Mm -hmm.